I guess it's the party of Virginia, has adopted a resolution opposing the ballot question. Um, but, in any, um, but at this point, VML, uh, and I will say also the Association of Counties, we are silent on this thing. We are not speaking to the public about, about these issues. Okay, uh, what does the amendment really change? The first part I want to talk about is lost profits and lost access. Uh, the amendment says that the General Assembly shall define lost profits and lost access, and they did. Uh, it's House Bill 1035 from last year, and it was interesting that this is probably the, I want to brag on VML a little bit, um, the business groups in the state, uh, including Dominion, Verizon, the gas companies, I think, um, and the chambers of commerce around the state, realtors groups, those folks, had all given up all hope of fixing anything. And you, some of the, anybody who was at the VML conference last year, we started making noise then particularly, and that noise followed them, our members home, and they talked to their legislators about some of these aspects. About, you remember one of the questions was, what if you close the street for a street festival, like the Second Street Festival, and you close that for a couple of days, and a business on that street um, can't do, can't operate for those several days, or you close the street to put in a sewer line, or fix a water line, and you close the street for a week doing that, and my business is closed for that week, do I get lost profits? Because the Constitution says, when there's a taking, I get lost profits. Well, VML made a lot of noise about that. It really did, and what we did energized the business communities that were uh, had been sitting on their hands, and they got off their hands, and they did work uh, to get House Bill 1035 changed significantly. For example, one of the big changes, the biggest cost of this, the biggest piece of this, is going to be the lost profits. And the original Tim House Bill 1035 said that a business would get its profits apparently in perpetuity. You'd have to capitalize what the profits would be pretty much forever, which could be a, a massive amount of money. Uh, it was amended to say through the session, it's three years of lost profits based on actual tax returns. And so it's that kind of work that at least got the lost profits provision, uh, to, I guess, reduced in what it's going to do. But, um, and also House Bill 1035 was changed to say that if you do close the street for whatever purpose for a week or whatever, and you don't file, and you don't take anybody's property, you just close the street for that week or so, that there is no claim for lost profits. Uh, so that's, you know, that's a good thing. Um, but even with that, the changes in House Bill 1035, in some cases, there's clearly going to be a windfall. If I have a business that's very profitable on a not very expensive piece of property, but say I make, I'm next to the, um, to the bluegrass uh, center of Virginia, and I make fancy good banjos, and because, that's where I, and I make a lot of money making banjos, but my property is not worth a lot. And they take my property for some reason, and, that, and I say, well, you know, my tax return shows that makes two, I make $2 million a year. That's $6 million, please. And the court says, okay, that's $6 million. It's three years in uh, profits based on your tax returns. And the, next, and the jury awards me that. And the next day, I decide, you know, I'm tired. I don't want to do this anymore. And I close up shop. And I was going to close up shop anyway. Well, it could be in that situation that the taxpayers of that locality <coughs> taxpayers of Virginia are going to pay that person the $6 million and he just walks away with a complete windfall. I will tell you that the, you know, the Virginia Supreme Court had ruled and there have been cases over about 100 years, people asking for demanding uh, lost profits and the court always said it's too speculative. And the kind of case I just gave you about the banjo maker, that's why it's too speculative, but it's the law now. It's going to be, it's going to be the rule. Now there are mitigating this, this, the code sections that House Bill 1035 creates have some mitigating provisions in them, and, and, and it's, it's going to be expensive to figure out how all that works out. Um, one of the things that's going to happen for, for your city attorney's office is that when you are acquiring property of a business, the business knows it's going to have rights to claim the uh, lost profits. However, 
you can't get the information. The city attorney's office can't get the numbers for that lost profits until it's actually in litigation. So, and it said the bill says the law says that they don't that the, that the city doesn't have to make an offer to the offer does not have to include lost profits. Okay, well if you don't include the lost profits, I'm a business owner. I'm going to say I'll see you in court, and then you have litigation expenses to go along with that. Uh, so it's going to make acquisition of property, even in, when it should be fairly simple, more expensive, I think, in a lot of cases. Now, what about major projects? Um, with, with the major projects, I want to use the example, and it's a somewhat painful example, I think, from Virginia's past, and that is when the Interstate 95 was put down through Richmond and it split Jackson Ward in two. Okay, uh, I think, as I understand it, that VDOT went through what it considered the least expensive area to put it through. That was a factor. Well, with this lost profits and lost access provision, the cost of acquiring commercial property goes up compared to what it is today. The cost of residential property doesn't go up. It stays fairly flat. So if I'm a VDOT and I have a major project to put through a locality, it's going to make it more tempting than it was in the past to go through a residential area as opposed to, to a commercial area so that your citizens, the citizens that you all serve, are the ones who will be impacted because their properties will be taken instead of the businesses that could be taken to do the same thing. Um, so that will probably be in effect. Um, and that's, so that's the sort of the part on the lost profits uh, and the lost access. Again, it's going to lead to a lot of expensive litigation. There are terrific unknowns. And then the next part is what are what projects are of public use? Uh, the amendment says, except for public service corporations, Dominion, well, I'm sorry, the gas company, electric company, phone company, those are public service corporations, and the railroads, a taking or damaging is not for public use if the primary use of the property not the purpose, but the use is for increasing jobs, tax revenue, or economic development. I'll just focus on that part first. Um, so what projects that have been in this area have been for, a, been for economic development? I'll use that most generic, the, the one term. What about the Rolls-Royce plant in Prince George County? Uh, as I understand it, the county itself had to acquire the road right, some road access to make that project happen. Well, if that's not for public use, excuse me, if that public use isn't for economic development, which President Obama, Governor McDonald, everybody else has been there saying that this is a great economic development project. And it is, it is. And, and I don't think anybody would argue it was an inappropriate use of of public funds to buy that road access to get, you know, to make that project happen. It helps a lot of people in that area, a lot of jobs, a lot of a lot of development. But um, if if the primary use of the of that property then is a is for economic development and if I own that piece of property that they had to take and I don't want it to happen for some reason or I just want to be I just want to maximize the return on my property. I would go to court and say, Judge, this you're they're trying to beat us, the county's trying to acquire my property. It's it's not for a proper public use, it's for economic development. Therefore, they can't make me sell it. I don't want to sell it. And and if the judge, if the judge answers yes, that's right, it's for economic development, then what will happen is then I'm a landowner and I set the price. Fair market value, yeah, that's out the window. It's just whatever I want to charge. And the locality either pays whatever I want to pay, or they don't do the project. So I think that that's that's going to be one of the longer term impacts of the uh, of this of the amendment. It was uh, certainly you all have heard everybody's talked a lot about the uranium the potential potential uranium mine in Pennsylvania County. I guess it is. Well, that the the roads to that farm that are the sort where that mine's going to be if it happens are narrow, twisty, uh, light duty roads. So then let's say the, the law changes to allow that mine to go forward and they decide to start it. The, the company, 
that is going to do the money would probably pay VDOT to widen those roads and acquire the land to make them heavy duty to handle the truck traffic to be going in and out. Wouldn't that be for economic development? If it is, that project won't happen. Uh, and, and for a lot of people, that's a good thing. You know, it's funny from VML's perspective, this could end up being, this part of this amendment could end up being the most significant anti sprawl measure the General Assembly ever hoped to pass. Because quite often in the counties, they have plans to build major water and sewer extensions and improve the roads to a new area to allow a new area of the county to develop. Uh, and, and if those kinds of projects are for economic development and they can't happen, then of course, then you know, people are going to look at it and say, hey, we guess we're going to have to we're going to build in Richmond because we can't extend the part out to Eastern and Rock and Rival County or whatever. Uh, so maybe I'm for that. Maybe I'm for that. I don't know. Um, by the way, it was it. Um, I had, of course, I would talk about this to the members of the General Assembly, and they would say, oh no, no, that won't happen. However, the General Assembly enacted two bills to try to fix that problem. I showed that they actually recognized that that is a problem. And that's the kind of language that BML was working on having changed. It didn't work out. Okay. But specifically for Richmond, the place and, and the, the cities of Virginia, blindly, it says that uh, the amendment says you can't condemn for economic development except for the elimination of a public nuisance existing on the property. That's that part, that one piece of that was preserved. The question is, what is a public nuisance? I put two examples. They're not Richmond. I just found them on the internet. But the, the house on the left, that looks like New Orleans to me. But the house on the left, okay, it's in the middle. There's a house here that's certainly occupied. The house over here is occupied. That house is obviously just, you know, abandoned and derelict. Uh, that's a nuisance. It's certainly a private nuisance. It's a nuisance to the person who lives here and the person who lives over here. But I don't know that it's a public nuisance. Um, you know, I think that's going to be a question. And the same thing, this, this is a boarded up town row house, obviously an occupied house uh, on one side and the other. And so, yeah, that's a private nuisance. So if, I'm, if I happen to be the landowner of, of either of those nuisances, and the city decided to use the spot light program because, hey, there's a danger that one of those catch on fire, burning down those couple of, of adjacent houses, and I don't want the city to take my property. I'm going to say, well, wait a minute, under the constitutional amendment, you can only take property for the abatement of the elimination of a public nuisance. And it's interesting that the, the state, the current code section on this same topic does say that you can take for white property. And it says white property is defined as one public nuisance or any structure that is uninhabitable and violates the basic codes. Clearly, both of those are uninhabitable buildings that violate the basic codes, which means under the current state law, you can condemn them. But I don't know if you'll be able to. Nobody knows if you'll be able to. And Mr. Jackson and his crew will find out for you over the next some years. But, but of course, what that does for you, or to, to the citizens, is those citizens on these sides who would like to have the city do something, it may you may find out that you actually can't help them in that situation because of this not a public nuisance. Um, so you know that'll have an impact. It'll it'll um, it'll harm those those little blocks and neighborhoods where you're trying to do good job, do good projects. So uh, the next part is one that I know has to be. Uh, an unintended consequence, and that is uh, that the amendment to the, the amendment says that the General Assembly shall pass no law whereby private property, the right to which is fundamental, shall be damaged or taken except for public use. And then that same section of the of the uh, Bill of Rights provides, as it says, uh, you can't discriminate on the basis of religious conviction, race, color, sex, or national origin. Well, it creates a situation in the Virginia Constitution where property rights are described as a fundamental right. And no, no other of those rights listed, race, color, sex, national origin, religious conviction, are, are defined as fundamental rights. So if there is a conflict between a religious right or a right based on sex, color, national origin, and it goes to court, how is the court going to rule? 
you know, the court may say, well, it says that the property right is fundamental. These other rights are not. Therefore, the property right has to win in any contest between those two kinds of rights. Um, that will probably happen, and we'll see proceedings on that. Some poor judge is going to wonder why he ever chose the profession uh, to try to figure that out. Obviously, there's protection in the, in the U.S. Constitution. You know, there'll there'll be that kind of protection, um, but it's going to be a, it's going to create issues. We think. Um, I didn't put it in here, but there is another minor piece to it, and that is today you can when you condemn land if you leave an uneconomic remnant. Uh, you can only, it says today the law says you can only condemn the land that you need for the project. So if you need five acres, somebody has ten acres, you can't say we're taking the whole ten acres. But then the comp, the amendment, excuse me, the law today says that the you can negotiate with the landowner and take that whole ten acres, and so that they don't get stuck with that quote uneconomic remnant. The amendment does not give you that freedom. It just says you cannot acquire more than you need. So then you pay the landowner something for that five acres of damages to that five acres that you don't pay. But it's interesting, it's going to, I think it's going to have an impact on, the, on that taxpayer because that tax, that five acres is going to remain on the tax rolls forever. And, it'll, and it, may, you know, it may be a diminished value, but it will have a value and it will end, end up paying taxes on that property. So it, that, in that kind of same case, you know, it's a burden of the landowner that you really want to deal with. So, um, other than that, it's a pretty good deal. Uh, and, uh, we, we think that, you know, I guess as I started out, I wanted to, you know, all I can do is raise questions here because nobody has the answers on all these things. And over the next 20 or 25 years, we'll find out. But you can imagine if you were trying to do, if you were trying to do the financing for a major project, and right now, if nobody has the answers about what these costs are going to be, how do you estimate the costs of your project? Uh, it's going to make those, you know, putting together those kinds of projects is going to be a very lot of uncertainty. Uh, so that's, I think, where we're headed. And be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, and we'll see what happens in November. Are there questions? Thank you, Madam President. Uh, there is a resolution um, for this body should come up the next uh, council meeting uh, uh, asking people to vote no on this constitutional uh, amendment. Um, and uh, I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Plan, for your presentation. Would you consider this to be one of those uh, answers out there that's looking for a, uh, for a question? Oh, uh, very, very much so. And of course, this all started with the Kilo case out of Connecticut, 2002, was it four, four, I think. And in Connecticut, there was authority to acquire your land and, and convey it to Charles. We didn't have, we don't have that authority here. So there was a problem that didn't really exist in Virginia that the Supreme Court then, you know, that raise the awareness of that issue, certainly. Um, and then there has been, of course, a, you know, the sort of the change in the political mood of the country. And so this became a vehicle, I think, for people to express that political mood. Um, and so we ended up where we are today with the language we have today. And uh, procedurally, will it take at a minimum three years to, to undo this? Yeah, oh yes. Uh, one, the, certainly the political climate would indicate that it would take more than three years. Uh, but just, but just our structurally, uh, I just proceed structurally, it requires an uh, adoption by the General Assembly of the amendment language uh, in identical form over two years with an intervening election. So, it actually could have, since, let's see, in the 2013 session, you could say, conceivably, you, uh, an, an amendment to this amendment could be introduced and passed. There would be the intervening election in November 2013, and then adopted in an identical form in the 2014 session of the General Assembly, and that would be it. So it would take two years. 
for that, and then the then the vote was at November 2014, and would be in effect 2015. So yeah, coming through. And while the supermajority is required mm -hmm. to legislate into this, it only takes a majority vote of the people in order to pass a constitutional amendment. Correct. Correct. Uh, this is just really sad, and I'll, I'll put this uh, probably not the tragedy that the last constitutional amendment that we passed was, uh, which uh, defined in, uh, our constitutional discrimination based upon sexual orientation. But if we're all alive and well in 20 years, I hope that both of these are revealed. Uh, I just think it's bad law. And it's unfortunate that there's so many ballot initiatives this year, let's say contested elections, and speaking of people that are concerned about this issue, no one wants to spend the resources because everyone's convinced that this is a fake on plea. And that's unfortunate. I think the timing on it, if it were a year when a lot of other issues weren't on the ballot, presidential election, senatorial election, maybe folks could try and get interested in it, but it doesn't seem like anyone wants to spend a dollar to, to move this against it. And so that's why I brought up this resolution to at least shed some light on an issue where we've had a lot of heat, uh, but not much light at all. So thank you for shining a light on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Albert. Other questions, Mr. Jewell? Yes, thank you. Um, Flint. Um, actually, I'm with Ms. Pilby here. A, it doesn't appear that there's anything likable about this uh, to begin with. But, but number two, because it emanates from Kilo, which had everybody sort of freaked out, it almost turns on its head, it appears, uh, the very countermeasure that I thought they were trying to strengthen. Um, this, this almost opens the floodgate uh, in so many ways to do just what we don't want Kilo doing. Am I, am I getting close to right? I mean, how do we get language twisted like that? Well, well the, the one, there certainly is one, I think, clear way that it will uh, Kilo was, Kilo of course said, yes, there is authority in the U.S. Constitution for the Connecticut law to take from one property owner to move to another. As I indicated... For well, the economic development purpose. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. As I indicated um, in the lost profits piece, if I get a, if I, my business, if it gets a windfall of lost profits of six million dollars, then it takes the taxpayer to pay for that. So, you know, I'll use the example if it was a small town that didn't have a you know, great budget, uh, then, then, you know, the rest of the taxpayers would see me and say, hey, I just gave you part of six million dollars. So, which that is taking one person's property taxes and giving it to another. Well, um, and, and my hearing is a little bit that uh, nobody's out there educating or fighting this thing as we fought amendments in the past. Nobody seems to know very little about this thing. Madam President. Yes, sir. Thanks for that. Uh, no, I'm speaking with folks that are, that are opposed to this, uh, who potentially could have some resources, and I don't want to name any names per se, but they're, they're just telling me that this is not uh, a fight that they feel like is, is worthy of weighing in on given limited resources and they feel like this thing is going to pass and a bunch of uh, disinformation is out there about this that, until they're just saying that they just don't have the resources to spend to try and stop it. Uh, I've heard anywhere from 70 to 80 percent uh, is the range where people feel like this thing will pass. So when you're fighting against those kind of odd times, I understand people's positions, but it is unfortunate. But BML is solidly opposed. At this point, uh, Madam President, at this point, BML is public matter completely silent on it, um, and that is because, as Mr. Gilbert indicates, we agree with that assessment of likely uh, 
vote on it. And there's just no point in doing anything at this point, at this time. What we will do is, of course, House Bill 1035, the legislation that creates, does have some protections for local governments in Virginia. As I've indicated about, it's only three years lost profits. Uh, it's required to be a material change in the access, not just a change. Um, and you know, at one point it was a, the, the one point the bill said any change you had to pay for. It. So if you move the curb cut 50 feet, you had to pay for it, even though it had no effect. And now it's a material change. Um, and and then there is the provision that if you have to close a street without taking any property, that that's not compensable for profits and access. So um, we will work over the next hour long to make sure that, that con those kinds of protections remain in the code. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments? Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you thank for you. explaining it to us. And I think we probably don't look forward to working with you if it gets passed. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks. And I think before we go to Ron, let's go through. We have a very short topic for tonight. Um, we only have a consent agenda. And so what I had um, planned to do um, tonight is go right to our consent agenda and then go public. So, Mr. Kirk, do you want to discuss yes. through that document? Yes, on the consent agenda, we have item number one, ordinance number 2011 159, to amend the city code concerning private public education facilities and infrastructure act of 2002 to require the review um, committee that reviews all such proposals to include a person selected by the city council to represent. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. Item number two, ordinance number 2012-29, to authorize a special use of 122 10th Lane for the purpose of authorizing a lot split that would result in an additional mile to be served by private access easement. And that's to be continued until the uh, 22nd, October 22nd. Thank you. Ms. Parker, we go back to the before. I'm sorry, did you want to speak to that? Sorry, I thought you were just hearing these many questions. Good afternoon, council members. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the process after this, then you would take a vote later on that particular item. Correct. And I wanted to make sure at uh, the previous meeting there was a few questions about what was the penalty associated um, with this type of item and selecting an evaluation committee if somebody should breach that process. And what I did find is it would be a class one misdemeanor and I do have the section of the code that speaks to that about that information. As well as um, in the past a few committee meetings, council staff, procurement staff did some outreach of benchmarking to see what is the trend in selecting evaluation committees in Virginia and throughout the United States. And the trend is usually that rest with a combination of a user department and or the direct, director of procurement services. Even with the federal government and housing, um, the director of procurement services does uh, validate the selection of an evaluation committee. Um, with that, I'm understanding you would like to have more transparency in that process, and I would like to recommend on behalf of administration that we work with the law department to update the PP a guidelines because in doing that there's probably a room for more information to be released during that process versus the selection of evaluation committee members. Um, last piece, recently when we got our NIGP certification accreditation, um, what we're doing right now in this process is in alignment with that accreditation and that was not, hard, that was not easy to achieve so I just want to let you know that there are ways for us to get the transparency that you're looking for, but I would recommend that we find another vehicle other than the involvement and putting anyone at risk, being on the evaluation committee, selecting, and all of that. When those guidelines change, I'd be happy to pay your paper to remove this requirement, but I think 
because PPEAs aren't something we do every day, this is not an immediate risk to have this paper on the books. Uh, like I said, uh, Mr. Persinger, you've got the data pointed right at me. When the guidelines change to create more transparency, I'll put in a paper to remove this requirement. Mr. Jewell. I, uh, um, I, I, I don't know how much more risk exists for a person appointed by the council to serve on an evaluation committee than it is for anyone that you or the administration will report to serve on that evaluation committee. Um, uh, the, the law applies to all. It's number one. Without impugning anybody, uh, some of the things that I've heard regarding the one uh, BEA that we're more, most familiar with is that the evaluation team uh, was prepared to vote on a given day after all the interviews. Uh, and they were held up until which time questions could be raised or run by the CAO. Now, again, I wasn't there, I don't know how true that is, but I thought you were given special uh, uh, powers as director of the group in order to create a firewall between yourself and the administration. Uh, if that happened, we need somebody there to prevent that from happening. And, and so that's why that paper, to me, is so important. And uh, uh, certainly we can't run the risk of running the foul, uh, as I suspect you did with that last venture. So I'm, I'm with you, uh, Mr. Samuels. Uh, we can fix it later, but we need something like that. I don't know all the particulars, Mr. Jewell, and what you're speaking of, um, but I'd be more than happy to address your concerns. Overall, uh, I've worked in a number of places, um, and here, PPEA Evaluation Committee or not a PPEA Evaluation Committee in the industry is recommended strongly that we try to make sure as much as possible that you have your user agencies involved in the selection with the validation usually of a director or of procurement services. I'm not sure, I'm not aware of what you're, you're speaking of. There are points in a process um, where updates may need to occur to a user department representative because it's an evaluation committee and sometimes updates needs to take, need to take place and then that's managed by the Department of Procurement Services. So I assure you that uh, we do what we do in alignment with the guidelines. I believe that we can get to your concerns by updating um, the PPEA guidelines. And as Mr. Samuel said, we, we haven't used it recently. I'm not sure that we will be using it in the near future. We now have design, build, and see the risk at our uh, disposal, if you will. And so that's a vehicle by which we can do a lot of things that we didn't have before. Uh, so again, on a number of fronts, I'm asking for your approval to consider allowing procurement to work with the law department to update the overarching PPEA guidelines. Again, when we got that accreditation for the Department of Procurement Services, there were a number of things we had to pass and a number of things that that um, accreditation looks at. And they look at, they look at the involvement of your government and your procurement processes. So on a high level, I really believe we can um, grab some of your concerns so that the process is more transparent and you'll be able to get more feedback. And I think that's what you're looking for, is more feedback along the way. Well, Madam President. Yes, sir, Mr. Um, I think what we're looking for is better assurance that we've got a fair process. And, and again, uh, I've been an activist on behalf of minority contractors for a decade. Um, and we've had um, African-American mayors as far back as you want to go, all of them have said we're going to fix this problem. And uh, it doesn't get fixed. And at the very heart of the analysis, you, 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 it becomes very clear that where the problem exists is down in the bowels of the system. 
in the bowels of the system, and that focus could be no closer to the bowels of the system than on those evaluations. And I'm not impugning anybody, but I am saying that therewith lies the need for scrutiny. Thank you, Mr. Jones. As it relates to, um, thank you, Madam President, um, as it relates to your reference to the certification, having this um, legislation on the books that a council would appoint a representative. Um, this would only take place if for some reason we were entertaining um, procurement through this process, right? Because the, the committee is only appointed at that time, right? For PPA, right? Yes, ma'am. So, so having this piece of legislation on the book and having not used it should not have any negative consequences as it relates to evaluation as it relates to the certification. Is that Possibly, and the only reason I say possibly is when we apply for those accreditations, they look through your policies and procedures, and we give them access to the whole thing. So probably when they're looking at that PPEA or, or non-PPEA, they're looking at how you select your evaluation committees. Yeah. Um, okay, then with that in mind, what is the second Every three years. Every three years. We just finished one? We just finished one. Okay, so we would not be um, up for recertification for at least the two and a two half, half year period. Mm -hmm. um, what is your timeline for the revisions to the policy and working with the legal department? What is your timeline of in all fairness to Mr. Brown, um, we can move PPEA guideline updates to uh, a higher level in our updates because um, we have a master plan and we were trying to be finished with the updates to policies and procedures between, I think it's June 2013 and September 2013. So we had to put all the items in queue. Right now, PPEA was um, lower on the scale because we didn't foresee anything coming. But we could definitely work together and move that up. And I would recommend, without talking to Haskell, we might be able to move it to like, you know, January, February, even sooner. But I really would like to sit with him because we have to work together. Thank you very much. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. All right, Mr. Kirk. And item number three on this note. Madam yeah, President. Yes, ma'am. Um, just to follow to the Vice President, and I apologize if this was stated and I was uh, slightly distracted, but um, how long would it take to craft the kind of uh, amendment that we are talking about and that Mr. Sanders would be willing to do paper? With these two entities working together, you have a sense of timing. I hear that it can be moved up possibly to January, but what are we talking about on parts of that investment? Mr. Sanders? If I understand your question correctly, you're asking if it's paper passes and they move up the timeline, how quickly can we get an amendment to it? Um, not quite, but close. Okay. Would they gave, I'm asking about the time frame because it might be that we continue for that length of time to see if they're able to come together and produce what it is that would address the concerns that generated this paper to start with, um, but without taking off the table. So until you're sure that you know the items have been you know the matters. So, so, that, so that's the question. That's definitely not a question I can answer. Okay. That would be something for Mr. Jackson, Mr. Brown, and Mr. Jim. Yeah, I think what Ms. Duvall is saying, would you be willing to continue this paper 
Jewish Human Day may be February 1st or March 1st so they can back with the procedures and then see if your questions are answered by this policy changes or if you want to go ahead with this paper. I was anchored. Well, that wasn't quite it, but I was going there. Okay. If it was, in fact, that the time would be uh, reasonable to have the matters addressed and this would go on in perpetuity as an in a issue here. I introduced this paper on September 12, 2011. I've been banding oh. trying to get support now for over a year. I think I finally got it where the majority of counselors on board with it. I'd like to move forward. Like, and like I said, you can read the transparency, I get rid of the tip bar. No. Not you specifically. <laughs> Any other discussion on this paper? Madam President. Mr. Mr. Hill. I have expressed concerns uh, about transparency as well. Uh, what I think I heard earlier was that uh, that the administration would move more in that direction and it seems like to me that we're we're doubling down on getting into a dangerous position when we're getting the council representatives. I appreciate that we backed off with an actual council person. But it, it it seems to me that elected officials should stay as far away from the procurement process as possible. That that is described with public uh, mistrust and uh, just a lot of well-deserved uh, cynicism out there. And so I'd like to see us uh, you know, move away from that. And it, and it appears to me that instead of moving away from it, we're saying, well, the administration is involved in it, so therefore we need to be as well. Maybe I'm misunderstanding that, but it just seems like to me that uh, I just want to stay away from procurement issues. It's not, uh, and this gives us one degree of separation from it, uh, but it appears to me that uh, it's, it's a step in, the, in a direction that I don't want to be headed. It would, does anybody have any, well, first of all, if anybody has any feedback for me as to whether I heard the earlier version of this correct, and I'd be happy to listen to it. Thank Ms. you. Mr. Chairman, I think the reason for this paper is not for somebody from, this is my understanding, it's presented to Mr. Chairman at the same time. But uh, I believe the genesis of this paper was we just wanted to make sure the procedure was, pro was followed properly. Not that um, whoever represented the council would have, um, would be able to vote on who the procurement went to. Is that correct, Mr. Samuels? But just the person there we just to make sure that the process was being used. The, the bottom line was there's so many uh, issues and complaints about the jail procedure. Uh, there were some strange activities that went on regarding the restaurant uh, here in City Hall that we really did have to do something to let people know that we're working to improve the situation. And this way, we got eyes on the table, ears on the table. Uh, we're not driving the process. We're not forcing anybody's hand. We're simply there so that we can feel comfortable that things are going the way they ought to be. Um, so, kind of if I may, here. So this would, I mean, every legislative body has oversight of every administrative body, and so while this is not uh, overt oversight, it's certainly keeping us informed, I guess, is the intent of what I'm hearing today. It's a good way to say it. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Cowley? You know, I think we were in here the last meeting, and we had agreed to strike that one part of this, you know, members of the council to make it power. I think now, I think it is power. I'm a support I mean, it would be a little different situation if the administration is not with Mr. Samuel before this meeting, but come at the last minute and say, well, all of a sudden we want us to back off. I really can't support that, so I do support this paper. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hill. Thank you. Mr. Hill. Thank you. 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 Th
Thank you. Madam President, can I get a second here on the time again that it was going to take? Oh. I never got a sense of how much time between the two working together with some legal and German. You wanted to know approximately how much time we would need to work together with That's what I was thinking. Do they 
in the proposal? Are there ex, is this going to be an ex officio member of this committee? Uh, so we need, in my opinion, to determine the authority to review committee if we're going to appoint someone to do it. If this is a purely advisory committee or if they don't make an official recommendation. I mean, I think they do, but I think we need to find out what the powers of this review committee. And these are in small letters, so is there really you know, a PPA review committee that's an actual body established either by guidelines, regulation, or code? I assume it's not by code, but to me that's the crux of the issue. What is the authority of this review committee? Mr. Daniels? The review committee is going to review all proposals solicited and unsolicited pursuant to the PPE Act. And it can add other members that it thinks is essential apart from the four listed in the ordinance, which is basically OMPD, uh, Director of Procurement, the departments affected by the proposal, and a person selected by City Council to represent City Council. So this is only in regards to the PPEA? This is only in regards to the PPEA. I, I need to ask, uh, where there's a dime of difference between um, appointing someone to this evaluation team to represent the, um, the, the interests of council and appointing persons to the uh, uh, planning commission. One of my own people who has the right to vote and they're dealing with me, multiple millions of dollars uh, of, of projects. Um, I, I don't understand the difference. Uh, uh, with the very important element of fidelity to secrecy, uh, that aside, I don't see a dime's worth of difference. So why are we in problems here? We need someone to assure more than a decision that the procedure is being handled correctly. That's my biggest May I speak? Yeah. And I know yeah, everybody's going to do. Into it. <laughs> um, I know everybody's going to do what you want to do at the end of the day. I am going off of industry best practice. We want to minimize the risk for council administration in expecting any type of feedback from any participants who sit on an evaluation committee. Just so you know, a lot of times we have challenges getting people to sit on an evaluation committee. A number of reasons that they don't want to feel as though they're in a position, that they have to give information that they don't want to give. Nobody wants to be at risk for potential class one misdemeanor. So rather than putting uh, yourselves in a position to even select someone, if we update this PPEA guidelines, there are, I'm surely there are ways where we can share information collectively with counsel at clean, clear, different points in the process so that you can be informed. Um, I assure you that that can happen. I just believe from my professional experience, it's more risky by having um, your positions involved and even you know, on an executive level, getting too involved in selecting evaluation committee members. We did industry best practice. We shared the information in October of 2011. I do apologize that we did not share with city, all of city council prior to tonight, but then the numerous meetings we had, I think it was a government ops, we did a meeting, um, finance and economic development committee, many meetings. We've shared the information, I bought copies tonight, so that you see what I'm asking of you is in alignment with industry best practice. So I'm passionate about it because I'm concerned that we would shift at this point, even though this may seem small, it's important, we don't, I, I, I would hope that we can keep this in alignment so, so we can keep our accreditation and we can stay on track. We talk to more than 15 governmental entities and ask questions. Who selects your evaluation committee? Why do they do it that way? And the consensus from council staff's research and procurement staff research was the user agency in conjunction with the, the, the procurement department. That is how it is done. 
And that is the practice of the industry, and the core reason is to do our best, as best we can, to remove and eliminate uh, politics whenever possible from the process. We do our best. And that's why I know PPEA, you guys have to make the final vote, and I respect that wholeheartedly. And that's why I'm saying, let us work with the law department. The law department and I work well together. We're going to find ways to make this process more transparent. Mr. Jewell, the things you heard, I don't, I don't know about what's been heard. I know about the facts that I dealt with. So I'm here to make you comfortable. I want to make you comfortable. And I recommend strongly. You're doing a sales Mr. job. Mr. Jewell. You're doing a sales job Mr. right Jewell. now. Sorry, I, need let's 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 I need to at least know that I can respond to this. Let her finish talking. Please. And then if you have something to say, you can say something. My goal is to recognize and respect that we need to make council comfortable. And what I'm doing is letting you know, sir, we've done a lot of research. Uh, I'll say it, you guys had us audited. And from all of that, we stand here today and we say to you, allow us to work with the law department to update the guidelines. If we've got a general law workload, which I'm doing it every day, to move this to the top of the list, we're more than happy to do that. But we, we've accommodated everything you've asked us for. And all I'm saying to you is based off of facts, data. And I have it here, and I do apologize again for not giving it to all of the council members. But we have data we shared in October, I think it was October 27th, at the government ops meeting of the feedback we got for industry best practice. We've done that. So I need to ask of you so that we can serve the council and the citizens of Richmond the best we can. We, we just want to have an opportunity to keep you informed, update the PPEA guidelines so that we can continue to do our jobs. That's all we're asking for is that opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Jewell, that was a very passionate appeal. Again, I'm trying to avoid any impunities. Um, I chair the government operations standing committee. I don't remember seeing this. My two members are here. They don't recall seeing this. It's been a year. It's been a year on probably the most eventful procurement that we have ever had in our history. And here we are asking for more delay. Uh, for what? Uh, I, I don't see anyone being in danger of class one misdemeanor if we're going to appoint someone outside of ourselves when we appoint people to do our bidding uh, uh, for boards commissions every day. What are we talking about here? We need better scrutiny of a process that for whatever reason seems not to work for everybody. Seems not to work for everybody. And if there's some dog in the cat, then we ought to have somebody there uh, uh, with eyes on it to at least make sure that the proper procedure that you tell, and I don't doubt those best practices are what we ought to be doing. But uh, I'm happy to tell you the specifics about what I'm alleging. And, and it's disturbing to know it. Uh, but here we are a whole year later talking about it, and all this could have been cleared up a long time ago. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. It would pass it tonight. I have no problem in ending this once these new regulations uh, for transparency come about. But this is a guaranteed way to make sure they do. Yes, yes, yes. Mr. Sanders, uh, the question that was raised earlier as it relates to whether or not the paper is specifically addressed for the role and the responsibility to be of, of the person that is appointed by counsel, uh, which, if I'm understanding what I'm hearing directly, that particular person's role would be different from the other appointed members. No, that, and I apologize for saying that earlier. The review committee reviews the proposal solicited and unsolicited 
this person would be a member of the review committee that would be reviewing proposals. It's a two-phase process. Two process. Uh, uh, conceptual phase and then the specifics phase, detailed phase. Uh, this person would be a representative, and again, I'm, I'm happy to change it later, but the bottom line is th this has been over a year, and it's time to move forward. In my opinion, tonight. Um, but right now, as the paper is written, the person would be on the review committee, have all the same responsibilities of every other member of the review committee. Okay, and as part of that responsibility, that person would be reviewing, but they would also be eligible for whatever vote action that any other members. Yes. Uh, 
questioning whether or not the procedure is even followed correctly. And, and I think those are two different um, concerns that I'm not sure that this paper addressed them specifically as it relates to the rule that the reason why counsel would have someone there. Um, but having said that, based on the fact that Mr. Sanders is not interested in continuing this paper, um, and the fact that we have recently received that certification, and, the, and there is no uh, PPEA that we know of that is in process, and you're just talking three to four months that the policy can be revised, working with the attorneys that we can bring it back to the council for review. Um, so the, the, the threat of certification is not an issue um, if we are two and a half years out. Um, do we anticipate, do we have any reason or any knowledge to anticipate that there's a PPEA before uh, the next three or four months? Yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. And Mr. Chow. Uh, thank you. Ms. Wright, just so you know, um, I had a chance while we were sitting here talking, and I was listening, and I just, just for the record, you did come to the June 28th meeting and present this packet of information. So, so I just want you to know that it was, in fact, at the subject, at the community meeting. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion on that paper? Okay, Mr. Clerk, let's move on. And item number three, one is number 2012, F-163, to the new ordinance concerning the Buffon Hope Community Unit Plan to amend permitted uses to include adult care residents use and to establish the number of permitted adult care residents dwelling in. Any questions on that? Whose district? Actually, it's yeah, it's on Iowa's road next to Chittenden Hospital, the extension of their uh, facility for rehab. It's a good project. Yeah, okay. it's, a, it's an excellent project. All right. And Mr. Clark, just because um, we still have to go through a legislative package, if you could just go ahead and read the number, okay. um, that could move us along. I know the full ordinance number 2012-165. Anybody have any problems with that? Okay. Right. Yes, sir. Do we know who's buying it? 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 Oh. Um. Does anyone know who's financing this? No. And I'll endeavor to find that out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Item number five, ordinance number 2012-166, continue to October the 22nd. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. Ordinance, item number six, ordinance number 2012-167, continue to November 12th. Okay. Item number seven, ordinance number 2012-168, continue to November the 12th. All right. Item number eight, ordinance number 2012-169. Any questions on number eight? <coughs> All right. Item number nine, ordinance number 2012-173. Any questions on that? All right. Item number 10, ordinance number 2012-177, continue to operate the 22nd. Okay. What was it? Sir? See that? Yes, sir. Mr. Joe? I'm looking at three million dollars, and I'm trying to understand uh, what what this is. That page needs to continue, Mr. Joe. Okay. I'm with you. Okay. I'm number eleven. What is number twenty twelve dash one seventy eight? All 
Item number 12, Ms. Walters, number 20, 12-179. Any questions at this time?
Ms. Johnson. It was 10 pages of what I think was the original. Yeah. That's why it, it, it was a lot of trees to do. I guess my question to you would um, be, on some cases, would we, are these all papers that we would be patrons for? Or some of no, some of these would be support, simple support. Uh, it seems like a lot. Right, it is. And so some of the, a lot of these would be simply take positions on, okay. stake out positions on these, and a couple of key ones, probably like CSO, you'd specifically make a specific ask because it's so unique to the city. And the staff and I would get together and bring, we'll bring those back to you for your consideration. Okay. Mr. George, could you identify those ones that we would actually ask to take on those? Just off the top of my head without any. CSO, um, probably some things on K-12 education, uh, pilot, uh, parking authority if need be, social, if needed, right, the social services issue, and probably food in the deserts. And according to the attorney, uh, we do have the authority to do the contract. We can take that one off there. Mm -hmm. Is that if I can clarify, the city has two sources of authority to handle parking ones to do it directly as a part of the city government function. The second is to uh, enable uh, the United Development Authority uh, to learn and operate in parking facilities, one of the specific uh, facilities that are within the jurisdiction of the BDA. If you want an independent parking authority that did nothing but parking, you would have to special legislation to do that. But if you simply wanted to have an authority to do it, you could have to be a So we, if, if we wanted to establish a parking authority, we would want to determine whether we were going to put it under the EDA or establish a single one. And if you decided to put it under the EDA, you need to do nothing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Jewell. The, the, the duties of such an authority or function of such an authority would, in your mind, uh, Mr. Attorney, um, just be focused around running these parking venues? It could be the full game from building uh, to operating. Everything between. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm having palpitations in my district about parking modes. Um, and the need for a parking study uh, of some sort that can begin to give us some kind of guidance as to how to alleviate these chokeholds that we've got in certain spots of town. And I've heard Public Works had somebody working on one. I saw, I saw Mr. Flynn here earlier. I don't know whether that comes from traffic engineers or what. Um, but I mean, I'm trying to understand who would be responsible for uh, a, a study that could begin to identify how we get out of this mess because it's going to get worse, not better. And Mr. Jill, I do there was a study done in 2010 um, that was done by the RAJ that was commissioned. Um, no, it was not done in 10. It was done, it was commissioned when, I think it was done in 10, commissioned by Mayor Wilder. And he was saying that that study going. Where were we from? It was, it was completed, I believe, in 2010. Um, but it dealt with parking issues, but not, and I'm just trying to sort of zero in on where you're going with this, not the kind of parking issues that you're talking You're talking about neighborhood parking issues. This was an overall, um, parking issues in the city, mainly in the very urban sections of the city, which is what an authority would 
determine. I don't know how much an authority gets into neighborhood parking. No, I don't know if it's on neighborhood parking. Downtown parking is atrocious. That's uh, that's what it's bottom about. Shop parking is atrocious. Main Street for me and what we call uptown, just above uh, between uh, Meadow Street and 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 uh, the Boulevard, they're open a restaurant every other day. <laughs> I, I've got an agreement with GRTC to let us use some of their space to to, to alleviate the parking woes, uh, but. That hadn't happened yet, and it looks like we're going to need some help even with that. It, it, Mr. Um, Mr. Jewell, what I know I've asked Lou to contact administration to come to the committees, where we can get them to come here with the parking study that we do have, mm -hmm. and then go from there. But I know this one that was completed. I'm happy to yeah. Okay. So, my question is this simple. Uh, if you need to finish, don't decide you don't want to put it under an EDA that you will need to put right. in the legislature. And we're trying to figure that out. I don't think we're ready. I don't think we're ready to have any yet, so I'm just so trying to bring this here. The next thing is that if you all in shouting agreement that uh, this these items should be in here, is there anything else that we've left off when we talk to you? Yes, sir, Mr. Uh, item number 28 on the original proposal dealing with what I was looking for was a differentiation uh, between certain users and among certain users. What I wanted to encourage was live music within the city of Richmond and giving the city the authority to differentiate between uh, these uh, entities. In other words, if someone is not playing live music, uh, then we did want to bring them in. Uh, in uh, rate decrease on the admission taxes and currently we don't have that authority as I understand the, the opinion of the city attorney's office and so this is all we're not asking for any money all we're asking for is to differentiate between a nightclub use or some other uh, event and I think we want to encourage uh, live music within the city uh, economic development job creation and entertainment district currently it's either all or nothing as to whether you're providing a, uh, a church social or or you know some disco somewhere that has been the scene of a lot of issues uh, or surrounding the police so what I'd like to see is for us to be able to this economic development tool, tool to encourage live music within the city and reduce or eliminate the submission tax for folks that are providing live music. So I'm not asking the General Assembly for any money, I'm just asking that the city have the authority to differentiate amongst uses for admissions tax and be able to raise or lower that depending on what we want to do. Is that, and I guess I'd ask for Mr. Jordan's opinion on whether that's going to pass. If not, I think you should ask for a study. Of sure. I think the question you'll get is what criteria is the city going to propose to differentiate between who gets the, who has to pay the full admissions tax and who does not have to pay the full admissions tax? I would say live music as an economic development tool as a job creator within the city of Richmond. So you'd say any venue offering live music would not yes. have to charge admissions tax? Or that the city would have the authority to charge different admissions taxes or lower ones for live music now it's either I think the only potential, the greatest potential is to downsize is getting, them getting a wrap around the axle on, on the criteria and having dealt with the, the group across the street for a long time, they'll come up with all kinds of scenarios for what to offer. You know, is the one guy sitting there with the trumpet playing in the background at the restaurant uh, or in the theater live music? Does that mean he doesn't, the, the National Theater doesn't have a charge of or so you got a lot of real music uh, the West, the bird. How about the organ offers live music? Does that mean you don't have to pay the admissions tax? Those kinds of things. I would argue that one musician creates one job that wasn't there before. So, I mean, so if I just want to put that out there, Bruce, for a bigger activity, maybe we can address that later. But I, I really want us to make a statement that, that we want to encourage live music in the city of Richmond. 
trying to get the lower rates for them. Uh, and Mr. Jackson, this is basically directed at you. Uh, we as a city are allowed to restrict speech based on time, place, and one other thing that's escaped my mind. Will, are we at all concerned this may be seen as a restriction on increase? You have to charge admissions to go to an art gallery. If you charge admissions to go to an art gallery you open it, you have to pay your 7%, but if you do it for a live music, you don't. I would, that, that's the first time I've been asked that question. I would have to think about it a little bit more. I understand the, the distinction that you're trying to make in there and tax type uh, uh, legislation uh, tends not to fall into those kinds of traps uh, so much as straight out regulation. Uh, so I would think that maybe it would go for a social like. I, I like the idea of encouraging growth to go where this will put us in a tenuous situation. And I guess my mm -hmm. question on that is do you have any idea what the fiscal impact of that would Well, I, I think that would depend on our willingness to what we would want to do to, to reduce these taxes, and we could certainly have a, uh, uh, an, an economic impact study as to. Um, the elimination of these taxes or the reduction of them versus the increased activity that we would get from uh, the sale of food, et cetera, at these, uh, at these locations. So, uh, you know, uh, a million times zero is still zero. If people aren't in the city spending money, uh, then I think that's an opportunity cost. I just, um, we have the infrastructure in place. We've got the workforce of uh, students and younger people. I think we need to provide them jobs and do it to the city of Richmond where we're collecting taxes on. Uh, I'd, be, uh, uh, I'd be happy to look at, uh, at something. I think we're going to have to have uh, some trust that we're going to be generating more activity than we were before. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we eliminate the thing wrong with that. Uh, but I, I do think it sends a statement that we're open for business and open for live entertainment. And if we don't get it passed this year, I want it at least out there for the General Assembly to see the, the potential of, of what this could do for us. And I think that I would, before I embrace this idea, I think I'd like to see what kind of criteria you and I have a line of conversation, what you have in mind being. Uh, a boxing match in the Coliseum, would that be entertainment? No, that's not live music. Okay, so a <laughs> body concert at the Coliseum <laughs> would be live music. That would be live music, yes. <laughs> we, we couldn't do enough to encourage more live music acts. If the, no, nobody wants to come here except uh, Elton John and Bruce Springsteen every other year. Uh, we really need to, we, we do need to promote this. It's uh, we have an active jazz community in the, in the city. Uh, I really think we ought to try and, uh, and push this as a, as a concept. And like I said, if it doesn't get passed this year, we get wrapped up on the axle. Uh, Mr. Gordon just uh, indicated that I think we, at the bare minimum, we can get this on the agenda to say this is what we want to do and we want to encourage live music in Tennessee. Okay. Yes, sir, Mr. Jewell. I, I stepped up for a second, so maybe I'm, I'm missing something, but are we talking about the admissions tax? Yes, sir. And uh, do we need that general assembly help to be we, we do. You know, right now. Yes, I'm sorry, Madam President. Yes, sir, Mr. Uh, the, uh, the admissions tax right now is either on or off. There's, the city cannot differentiate between live music acts or fine arts events or uh, if you're charging an admission, you have to charge the admission tax, and it has to be the same rate for everybody. What I'm asking is for the authority to differentiate between end uses so that we can encourage some activities and discourage others. Oh, okay. I got it. Thank you. I, I don't have a question. 
this item so we can do something else on this item. Is there anything else on this item? And I guess at some point, maybe the next meeting that we have, we're going to have to come back to this and determine. We've what got a couple here. more bites of the apple on this, okay. certainly. Mm -hmm. And you might have suggest that we add it to the list for, for further discussion. And then uh, the staff can go with Mr. Hilbert, do some research, and try to you know, lay out the pros and cons and some of the pitfalls about this to see if we're going to have a little bit more discussion on it. Okay, thanks. Um, well, thank you. Uh, yes, I need some clarification. Um, I have, and I can provide you with um, down to the census tract for the entire Commonwealth, the number of food deserts uh, that we are all um, confronting. And so I don't, uh, and so you can help me as to why this would not be A, still on, and B, under statewide issues that substantially affect Richmond. Um, and it also, this is, when I down to the census tract across the Commonwealth. I think the issue, Ms. Newell, that it was, um, my assumption is the incentives, uh, from, from my perspective, or my reading, incentives mean money. And if this is where we're going to ask the state for money, the state's not going to give us money. That's why. If you had something else in mind, I misunderstood what you intended. Uh, money certainly would be one of the items that I could say, but there might be other incentives as well. And so um, I guess the bottom line is I'm trying to monetary, like what any number of things that might um, help us deal with this very real So that. I think getting money is going to be problematic. Um, if there are some other type of incentives that we can think about um, that have a broader reach, that's why the, the other one in here on incentives for a folk farm is it reaches multiple markets. The, the people who need the, the produce and food, food desert as well as the farms are producing it helps put them to, those two together. Um, the, the pure reason I, that I didn't recommend it was because I don't think people will get money. If you'd like to have some more discussion on it, we can put it in the same posture as the last one. Yeah, I really would. And I'll provide the data as well so that, okay. I mean, the magnitude of this is not just Richmond. This is really across the Commonwealth. And um, I'll be happy to share that um, information. Um, I'll get with the staff. I'll get with you on that. Thank you. Another question. I'm assuming the uh, items to do with the um, Affordable Care Act, you're welcoming them back because we're basically on hold in the Commonwealth, is that? So many unknowns, I'm not saying that what our problem is, I'm going to come back with you in the next iteration, is some statements on support, not be silent on it, but some statements on okay. support of those things. Okay. Right. That's why they went into the all of the category. Okay, so then the items that you have included, because there was at least one in terms exchanges that didn't get it here. Is there a reason? I can put that on in there. Okay, because the other option is right. depending on what happens mm -hmm. according to our Commonwealth's position, um, either the state has to do them or the or the false to the feds. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Anything else? We all good. Okay. In regards to the composite index, I know that's something you've been bringing up over and over again. Um, it wasn't one of those things that you um, drew all of the lines through, so. No, I think I left all of them on the. Uh, it's so important to the city, and uh, you know, the past history in the last year is pretty, pretty indicative of that. So you have, um, you have your own. I have it under K-12, and it's just so important to the city, and, and there is a growing, there's a, a, a brand, I wouldn't call it an overwhelming groundswell. The lyrics not shaking, but we're starting to feel the pavement vibrate a little bit in terms of recognition that we need to look at the composite index and overall the school funding formula, and so we need to just kind of keep adding to the pressure. 
to send those questions to me so I can see if we have any in common so that we can get those meetings set up later. Thank you. Madam President. Yes, sir. As a follow-up to that, um, thank you. Um, I asked the uh, city auditor if he could give us a better take on the citizen satisfaction survey. Um, I was invited. Um, I assume that all members of council were invited to be given a briefing on this survey results. But then I find out that Mr. Tyler had not been invited, Mr. Trammell had not been invited. Do we have an email on the show? Did everybody? They made. My knowledge was it was done in August. I did not go because the consultant was here the week that I was at the beach, so I did not Did you all, did everybody get invited to have a briefing? Was. I think I did. Yeah. I don't know. Well, apparently everybody did not get a briefing. I believe everybody got the invitation. I'm not saying everybody went, but I believe everybody was issued. What I pass out to you is uh, what I requested uh, Umes to give us uh, something compelled. And so he's given us a 2010 survey result uh, percentages uh, as compared to where we are in 2012. Uh, these numbers are shocking. Um, and I urge you to read these and uh, at, at some point, we need to have a session to react to it. Um, but uh, to give us, I mean, what I received in the way of a briefing ain't close to what I'm looking at here. It's scary. Hey, Ms. Jewell, I, just a question, since I did not get briefed on the survey because I was out of town, were the same questions asked in both surveys? Like in 2010, the exact same questions were asked that were asked in 2012. So I, compare apples to apples. I asked him is that uh, he says that he was to have collaborated with this year's questions. Uh, and they didn't fully collaborate with him on these this year's questions. So we don't know the answer to that. Uh, uh, he'd be better able to answer that question. Because he was in somehow. I just put for looking at these. Involved. If we're looking at these as truly apples to apples, that's one thing. Well, if we're looking at these in a different light, then then we need to um, evaluate them. In well, we can double check that, but for him to give me this and to highlight in red and then the double red uh, uh, border. Uh, suggest that these numbers are screaming at us and we need to pay attention to them. Thank you, Mr. Bill. Anything else? That middle question. Yes, sir. Across, I mean, somebody said the auditor gave us an invite. Does anybody remember if it was email or was it otherwise? Because I don't know if my emails, but I don't see any of that. It was, it was not the auditor, it was the administration. Yeah. And it was my understanding, and I can't, I didn't make any phone calls, so I can't tell you, but it was my understanding that everyone was invited to come in and be briefed on the survey. The consultant was here the first week in August, and I just know that this, I wasn't here. Let me just add that, uh, Madam President, that uh, in my briefing, uh, I was told that if I had any questions or concern, to contact uh, Kelly Hopkins. Mm -hmm. So, I extend that to you. Um, any questions you need answered, I'll make contact with her. Madam President, yes, ma'am. Uh, I also recall correctly at the retreat, the administration offered to have a work session mm -hmm. with us to go into detail, uh, more specifically on the survey and what the findings were and so forth, because some of the documents that we were looking at at the retreat through we were seeing them for the first time. Um, and my understanding is that the administration invited us to please just sit down and have a little bit of money. And I think that since um, UNICH obviously has done an assessment based on Mr. Jewish request, um, and the P 
appears that whenever you just make some assessment on something, it becomes a, um, a very valuable tool to be used to determine the um, um, merits of what is done or what isn't done. Perhaps we want him to be a part of the work session and yeah. the ads kind of as a work process. So let me be clear, are you asking now, rather than um, having those individual sessions, that I set up a joint session for administration to review these results and to ask the city auditor to sit in on that? Okay. And I would think that looking at what we have for our docket, we have been to Richmond in two weeks. Oh, we have a, looks like we're going to have a white docket, so maybe we can get that briefing. As soon as you can see the document, you can get that And now I have one more request I'd like to make. Um, I think that the administration has offered an opportunity for both um, the paper in regards to the board to come before the land use committee as well as the finance committee for a choice. Um, but I do think that that is a significant paper that is going to have lots of questions. And the one on the road law, the uh, finance paper is being continued tonight uh, as relates to the road law. And so um, I know that the administration has offered the Spirit of Commerce to have come to land use and they've also asked about becoming the finance for the discussion. Um, Sure that the entire council is going to have lots of questions and interest in it. Um, so, the president is to uh, choice and recommendation as to what committee. But certainly, I think before it comes back to the council, we need to have an opportunity to review. Yes. Uh, there were two papers regarding that, and I think we said, um, I don't know what, I think we said, we don't need one, we know we want to send one social service to one. Um, health and human services and new education and the other one I'm not sure if I'm going to manage the finance I think I have to I just want to make sure that the uh, finance committee is aware of what the discussion before it comes back and since we're going to have venture Richmond here that could get um, lengthy let's go ahead and get that the survey results the first meeting of that Now, anything else? All right. This is back at six. Carol, you made it just. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.